could carry that kind of weight. It was my dream till I met you. I was breathing, but
this morning and it's so cool that we can express ourselves in worship in new ways creative ways I just love it having fun this morning well hey I'm really excited because this morning we have baby dedications I'm so excited so hey I'm gonna go ahead and invite the parents that are dedicating their children this morning up to the front you can line all along the front of the stage here spread out as they're doing that why don't you take a minute Greet those around you. Maybe go a little further than you usually do. And if you're joining us online, we're so glad you're here. Why don't you drop us a line in the chat? Let us know where you're joining us from this morning.
This is a good looking bunch, isn't it? Yes, yes. Woo, we're so excited. Yeah, come on up if you're not up here yet. Take, take a few steps, let's spread out a little bit. And then we really wanna see your pretty babies. Why don't you turn your beautiful children out to the church family yes. so that they can see them. Good morning, Grace Church. It is always a blessing when I'm able to come to this stage because this is the moment I get a chance to recruit. Okay, not for volunteers, so calm down, but we need them. But this is the moment I get a chance to recruit our soldiers for God's kingdom. Because when I look at the babies, that's what I see. I see soldiers in the making. Parents, first and foremost, I would like to thank you for choosing life. We thank you and bless you for choosing life. Grace, Grace, these parents are making a bold statement of faith of choosing to raise their child under God's grace and wisdom. Right. Most definitely. In Psalms 127.3, it states, children are a gift from God. And he, it, he, this is the reward from him. From him. This is a reward and a gift from him. So clearly these parents believe in that scripture because they're standing before us making this commitment to be godly examples for their child. Now, even though baby dedication does not secure salvation, it is a symbolic moment to where they are in agreement to entrust their child unto the God's will. So with that, we want to thank them and just bless them for that. Grace, if you guys can just stretch your hands out towards these families and pray with us. Oh, Heavenly Father, we come, we come just blessing you and thanking you for the gift you've given these parents. Lord, we ask first and foremost that you bless the parents. Father, we ask that you secure these children's future. We ask that you protect their future. Be a path, be a light to their pathway, to the promise that you have given them. Father God, we ask that you guide them and direct them for the purpose that you've created them. We ask that you protect their health. Lord, we come against and we reject any communicable disease, any viruses, anything that is coming towards these kids, any generational illness that's trying to attach themselves to these babies. Father, we ask that you cover their education even now as we vote in this season, that we vote in prospering for something for their education in the far future. Father, we ask that you strengthen them and encourage them. Lord, allow your spirit to rise up in them that they will be able to stand against the evil of the enemy, of the enemy that's out there that's going to come against them. Father God, we ask and we just plead, Father. Lord, we ask that you give them discernment even at this young age to recognize good and evil. We ask that you give them discernment to recognize and hear your voice that they may be able to be obedient in response to your calling. Father, we ask that they go out into the world as they grow. Father, that they stand and they'll be able to speak the word of the Lord. They will speak as we teach them to put on their armor, that they will be bold little soldiers as they grow. And they'll go out standing strong and firm on the word of God that they have been taught in the church and within the home. Father, we're here to partner with these parents. Father, and we just trust and believe that everything, we are united. We come together. You said we're two or more are gathered in your name. You should be in the midst. So we're standing and we're bringing these babies to you. We're dedicating them back and we just pray that you receive them and you lead and guide us all through this time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Right, thank you. You guys can take a seat. As they're doing that, we've got some video announcements for you. Thank you, Eva, and thank you, Vesta. I tell you, we absolutely love life. We love babies. We love seeing married couples get married and having lots of kids, so praise God. Continue to pray for these families. If you will, pull out your bulletin. I just wanna highlight a few things here. Lots of good things that are, that are happening in the bulletin, touching almost every age group, so make sure you check those out. 
If you're newer around here, there's a connect card right there in your seats and up in the balcony and online as well. Easy way to interact with us. Maybe you have questions about who Jesus is or about the Bible or why we do church the way we do. We'd love to interact with you. You can see how to do that there on that connect card. Or if you're online, you can see it down there in the chat. And maybe you have a prayer request and, and I wanna encourage you. We look over these every week and our team really takes it serious. We pray over every single one. We'll even reach out and pray with you over the phone or something like that, if you're interested in that. Uh, if you will as well, make sure you pull this out and see our Easter invitations. We have these at all of our booths throughout the campus. This is the time of year when people, they're willing to go to church. And, and I mean, even, you know, we have neighbors and coworkers that they would typically say, no way will I ever go to a church. But a couple times a year, they're open to it, Christmas and Easter. So we wanna encourage you, pick up a handful of these, keep them in your car, coworkers, neighbors, classmates at school. Let's pack this place out. Our team always puts on an incredible resurrection Easter service, and we're gonna present the gospel in such a simplified way that we're believing for our friends and family to be born again and saved. So let's pack this place out. Also know many of you come on these weekends ready to give tithes or offerings. We do that at the end of the service on your way out. You can see offering boxes at all of the exits. Or of course, if you wanna give online, if it's more convenient, you can do that as well. Now, if you're new around here, we take a segment of our service almost every weekend and we address issues that are affecting all of us. We call it our, our watch and pray segment. Jesus said to watch, in other words, to be aware of what is happening in the hour of history that you're alive and see sometimes in our case right now, how truth is being challenged. And he says to turn that into prayer. Don't put your head in the sand and don't just act like everything is normal when you know we're confusing gender or when we're uh, confusing how to address racism. All of these various things, we need to address them head on. Teresa is gonna address here in just a moment something very important as it relates to school board elections and the upcoming elections here in April. I wanna brag on her and her husband, Dan, here for a moment. They serve in so many capacities around here from stage managing here backstage or security or helping out with the food bank, helping run the cameras. They are just a tremendous couple and Teresa is so passionate about seeing our church civically minded and informed Let's hear what she has to say. Hello, Grace family. I'm Teresa with the Civic Engagement Team. If you remember, Ron and Wes mentioned during Sanctity of Life weekend about abortion petitions. Here's an update on that from Adam Schnelting. Hi, I'm State Representative Adam Schnelting from St. Charles County. There are some extremists from out of state who are trying to alter and change our Missouri Constitution. The primary reason for this is they want to enshrine abortion into our Constitution. And the primary reason for that is abortion is a very lucrative industry, not to the tune of millions, to the tune of billions of dollars. But I believe in our state, we need to value life from womb to the tomb, from the unborn to our elderly. One of the chief purposes of government is to protect life, liberty, and property. Article one, section two of our state constitution states that all persons have a natural right to life and that when government fails to confer this security, it fails at its chief design. If we enshrine abortion in our state constitution, all of the pro-life laws that we have on the books to protect the unborn and their mothers will be eliminated overnight. That means that women can no longer sue for malpractice. That means that minors can obtain abortions without the consent of their parents. And likely that means that taxpayer-funded abortions will become the norm. So I'm encouraging all of my fellow Missourians to decline to sign. This weekend after service, we are having a school board elections expo in the atrium. I'm here to stress that municipal elections is just over two weeks away. This Tuesday, you can start voting early. It is the chance for you to make your voice heard at the most local level. This is when we choose from our neighbors who will be our city mayor, our councilmen, and our directors of our school board. I often get the comment, I don't have kids in school, or they don't attend public school. Do you realize that 90% of students are in public school? This is 50 million souls. These are our future citizens, leaders, and voters. On average, 50% of your personal property tax and real estate tax are funding your school district. Last April, only 18% turned out to vote. 
Genesis 1:28, the Bible says, we are to fill the earth and govern it. You may think it's just one vote, but together we can make a difference. We can make a direct impact on the young families that are paying attention to what is happening in their public schools. Like my friend here at Grace, David Randleman and his family are working tirelessly to be a voice on the Lindbergh School Board. Thank you for keeping them in your prayers. If we who know God do not get engaged, evil will take up the space that we choose not to fill. Public school academic standards are at an all-time low. They are trying to eliminate standardized testing. And because the percentages of the students whose reading and math skills are below grade level, it is embarrassing. Equity-based outcomes are now the goal. Merit-based awards, such as valedictorian and class rank, are becoming a thing of the past. The public school's version of diversity and inclusion, it's written into policy, and it has been expected to be sought, valued, and embraced. Unless your values don't align with their narrative. Our children's mental health crisis is taking center stage and is no wonder with all the adult topics and the fear mongering that continues to be pushed upon them. If you have any questions, we will see you in the atrium. But before I go, one lie I would like to debunk is this idea of book banning. We would like to see for librarians to do a better job of curating the selection of books that are available to our students. And with that said, let's hear from our friend, Pastor John Amanchuku. Hey, it's Pastor John Amanchuku here known as the book banning pastor nationwide. And you don't want me to read the filth because it exposes the truth. Going woke won't bring daddy home. I've had enough. When we think about all of the things that are taught in the public school system today, gender theory, queer theory, intersectionality, critical race theory, the 1619 project, I've had enough. And hopefully you feel the same way. Thank you, Teresa. Again, I so appreciate her passion to see us as a church civically minded and engaged and informed as we head into this election season this year. So after church, do it. Get out there and hit up the, the expo and get some of your, your questions answered on, on how to vote. Also, I wanna just say a word about John Amanchuku. Many of you remember him. He was with us about a year ago. We're gonna get him back here sometime. What a gift. I mean, this guy, he's hitting school boards all over the nation and helping to give the church a strong voice. He's a, he's a youth pastor in, in North Carolina, and he is bold as all get out. We love John Amachukwu. Well, this weekend, we're in for a big treat. Many of you that may be newer around here, you may not realize that we have an East Campus, Grace Church East over in Granite City in Illinois, and Steve, which is gonna be sharing with us today, is the pastor over there, been there many years. Steve, I tell you, the guy, he lives evangelism on reaching the unreached. His life is a living testimony of reaching people. So we're gonna hear from him today. We are so honored by this man and what he brings to the table and the way that he serves the Lord and serves the church. So everybody, let's give Steve McKinney a big warm welcome. Thank you guys, thank you very much. It's always a privilege to be here. And as Wes said, I'm the pastor of our East Campus and I love our East Campus, but it, al it is always an honor and a privilege to be over here. So here's what we're gonna do today. We're gonna talk about something today called reconciliation, or better put, we're gonna talk about the ministry of reconciliation, which sounds a bit odd, but I'll break that down to you. I'll explain it in detail and we'll go for there. Now we're gonna do it with a few talking points. We're gonna talk about Harry Potter trees, Chicken noodle soup, 27 hours and 43 minutes, and of course, Jesus. You guys good with that? All right, so we're gonna dig in with that. So have you guys ever heard a song and then you couldn't get the song out of your head? Just plays over and over and over. A few years back, there was a song out, it was everywhere, and the song was called Gloria. And obviously, big blues fans, people love that, but that song, just got in your head every time you turned to the radio, every place you went, you ran into that song. Wedding ring receptions, um, it was just going over and over. And that song is what's called an earworm. And what that means is it's a catchy piece of music that lodges itself deep inside your brain and you just can't get it out. So scientists have studied this and, this, and discovered the reason this happens 
is the simplicity of the lyrics and how often they're repeated. And that just gets into our brain. And they're finding the human brain has a weakness for plainness, it has a weakness for simplicity. And this is called processing fluency. Um, the theory says that people are more likely to engage in, in a behavior that is easy to do or easy to follow. So today we're gonna look at the Apostle Paul and how he used processing fluency. Now Paul was ahead of his time in this, in this particular theory and in today's text, here's what he does. He sings the song of reconciliation and he uses the words over and again and he does it in a lot of different ways. He says you're reconciled, it's reconciliation, you're reconciling and then he uses the word again and then he says be reconciled. So here's what he's doing. He's using simple words repeated frequently. And that digs in to what we're going to talk about today. And at the very heart of the Christian faith is reconciliation. The reconciliation of people to God and then people to each other. And so reconciliation is this. It's the restoration of our broken relationship with God through Jesus where he takes us from being spiritually dead in Adam to being spiritually alive in Christ. And so as we look at this, this text, you're gonna see it. Now let me give you a little bit of context of the text that I'm gonna read. Paul spent about, he, he went on mission journeys, and he spends about 18 months in this place called Corinth, and he builds a church, but when he leaves, there are people that come in after him and they begin to question his authority. They begin to go after him and they say, hey, he's not really an apostle, he's not, he wasn't with Jesus. And so Paul has to defend that. And then what he also does is he, begin, he begins to, to correct the church. Now when you look at Corinth, here's where Corinth is. Corinth is spring break and Las Vegas on steroids. It's just a mess. This church is just a mess. If you read it, um, you're gonna see all kinds of crazy stuff that goes on there. So he's making some, some, some correction in the middle of that. So if you guys would stand with me, we're gonna read a text of scripture. I'm gonna start off and I'll have you guys jump in at a certain point. So here's what he says. He says, so from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone, the new is here. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. I'm gonna have you guys read the rest with me. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them, and he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. You guys can be seated and let's break this down. So you should have bulletins, into your bulletins, I always, I always put notes, and so in your notes, here's what I want you to see. The first thing I want you to see, I want you to see the focus of reconciliation, and here's how he starts off. He starts with this verse, he says, so from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view, though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. So here's what he's doing. He's encouraging believers to have a new perspective on others, to look at people in a totally different way. And here's what he's saying. He's saying, we used to look at Jesus as maybe a historical figure, but now we see him as Savior and Lord. And we see the difference that he makes. And then he extends it further. He's urging them to evaluate people, not on a worldly standard, not on outward appearances, but on the way that Jesus would have us look at people. As Christ's followers, we are called to view others with the understanding that they too can be transformed by the power of the gospel, no matter who they are. The power of the gospel makes a difference for everyone. And so this verse reminds us to look be beyond these e external factors and to see people as recipients of God's grace, our potential recipients of God's grace. And so the focus of reconciliation is people. And the reason for that is people, uh, God cares deeply about people. People really matter to God. 
on a completely deep level. Now, here's the problem. The problem is, as humans, we're all broken and we're all a mess. Can I get an amen? That's just simply the truth. And if you don't believe that's true, I'm gonna tell you how to find out if it's true or not. Here's all you have to do. Have a garage sale. That's all you have to do. Because garage sailors, they're savage shoppers. And they will just beat you down. You guys ever been to one? Don't go. Because they're just, they're crazy. But here's the thing. The thing about it is, because people are a mess, um, and what I see in our society now People struggle with hopelessness. They struggle with a lack of direction. They struggle with a lack of purpose. And I see this over and over and over again. And this has to do with identity. And so when you look at this, the people that he's telling us to look at or to consider are what's called in Adam. And I'll explain that. When you're in Adam, your spiritual identity is separation from God. In the context of the Bible, Adam represents humanity's identity in its fallen state. And so when Adam and Eve are in the garden, their disobedience results in spiritual death. It's separation from God. They're walking with God. One day, God says, hey, don't do this. They do it. He says, if you do it, you're gonna die. Well, they didn't die physically. They died spiritually. They lost their connection with God. And so being in Adam, means that we're under the influence of sin and its consequences, and the world is uh, under that same influence. And we're unable to save ourselves or to restore our our relationship with God through our own efforts. So those who are in Adam are searching for their identity in a variety of ways. And if you are in the world in any way and you look around, this is what you see. You see people that are searching, but here's the problem. It can never be found in any created thing. Blaise Pasquale put it this way. He says, there's a God-shaped vacuum in the heart of each man which cannot be satisfied by any created thing, but only by God the creator made known through Jesus Christ. My version of this is just this. There's a God-shaped hole in your heart that only God can fill. That's really what it comes down to in Romans 5, 12. Here's what it says. Let's read this together. Therefore, Just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin, and in this way death came to all people because all sin. And that one man he's talking about here, he's talking about Adam. That's where sin came through, and that's where the disconnection happened. And so this verse tells us that because of Adam's sin, and this doesn't seem fair, but it's the reality, we are all born into this world spiritually dead spiritually separated from God. Let me give you the second point. Let me show you the power of reconciliation. And you see this in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, and here's what it says. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, here it is, the new creation has come. The old is gone, the new is here. This is also a part of identity. Um, And so this is the new identity that fills the God-shaped hole. And there's two identities spiritually. You're either in Adam or you're in Christ. There's no other place to be. You're either in Adam or you're in Christ. And when you're in Christ, you're a new creation. You're spiritually alive. This is why we're called born again Christians, because we become alive to God. See, here's the thing that we have to remember. Jesus didn't come to make us good people. Jesus came to make us alive to his kingdom. Jesus came so we can become alive and make a difference. He comes to give us meaning and purpose. And listen, as Christians, your life will involve trouble and suffering and challenges. Are you tracking with me? It's just really the truth because that's how it is. And even in Christ, sometimes it becomes a little more difficult because we're dealing with spiritual battles um, that we walk into in the middle of it. And so there's an enemy that happens. But when you're in Christ, here's what happens your heart changes, and you begin to see life differently. Your heart begins to line up with the things of God, the things of the kingdom of God, and you care about people 
in a totally different way. You have a, a, a new purpose and a new idea and a new plan as you go through life. I'm gonna explain this further. I'm gonna explain how it works in the kingdom, okay? So there's a, a verse in uh, 1 Thessalonians 5.23, and let's read this. May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So here's what Paul is saying. He's saying that there, we are three-part beings. We have a spirit. Now this part of us is the part that is dead to God when we, we are born in this world, but it becomes alive to God when we become Christians. That part of us wakes up. It becomes alive to God. The light of Jesus shines in that part and brings us to God, and we have a new connection to God. Then he says we have a soul. And our soul is simply our mind, our will, and our emotions. Now, here's the responsible part for us. We have a responsibility to take care of our soul. It's really important that we do that. And then we have a body because we're three-part beings and we're supposed to take care of our bodies as well. So when we become Christ's followers, we have a changed heart. But here's our responsibility. It's in Romans 12, 2. And here's what it says. Let's all read it together. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Well, how do we transform? How do we renew our minds? We renew our, mind, we renew our minds through the word of God. We renew our minds through hearing messages. We renew our minds when we enter into the things of God. And so our responsibility is to follow that up, is to continue to renew our minds. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever been around a Christian who doesn't act like a Christian? And so you look at them and say, wow, how can that person be a Christian? Well, here's the thing. Some people are further along in the process than others. It doesn't mean they're not a Christian. They're still alive to God. They just haven't come there that far. So when you see that, just remember that we are all in process. And there's gonna be areas that you're stronger in than others and areas that you're weaker in that, than others. We're all broken in different ways and so what we're doing is we're renewing our mind and we're growing in the grace and knowledge of Jesus. Make sense? All right, let's go to number three. Number three is what I call the call of reconciliation and now here's what happens. This comes back to us, and so in 2 Corinthians 5, 18 and 19, here's what it says. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting people's sins against them, and he has committed to us the, the message of reconciliation. And so our task in these verses is spelled out very quickly, or very simply, and here's what it is. Those who are reconciled are now reconcilers. And so we have this call to us. And when you become a Christian, your life changes. You want to tell people about that. You want to let them know what happened. And so, but here's the thing, the phrase that says, all this is from God, it places the emphasis on God and not us because God did it all for us. And so our enmity against God has been eliminated by God himself. Jonathan Edwards was a theologian, and here's what he says. He says, you contribute nothing to your salvation except the sin that made it necessary. <laughs> and that's the truth. It's like we bring this brokenness to the Lord, and it really makes a difference. I provide my weakness, I provide my brokenness, and the Lord takes care of everything else. And so it says, Christ reconciled us to himself. And listen, we cannot make ourselves right with God. There's nothing that we can do, no human effort, no good works that can make ourselves right with God. So God's wrath is directed at us, and if there's gonna be peace, he's the only one that can make it happen. And so in Romans 5.10, here's what it says. It says, for if, while we were God's enemies, so if you notice, here's what that means. We're born at odds with God. That's what this verse is saying. We're not born as Christians. We're born in Adam. And so he says, so while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him 
through the death of his son. How much more, let's read the rest together. Having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Not only is this so, but we also boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. And there's the word again. You see that word throughout the scripture. So we're born at, odd, at odds with God, and we can't boast. We can only boast in Jesus. Let me give you the fourth point that I see in this text. This is called the good news of reconciliation. And this is in the 20th verse. Here's what he says. We are therefore Christ ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. So we're called to passionately urge people to be reconciled to God. And maybe you're not the type to share your faith, but there are areas that we partner in service and making a difference because we work at a team. There's a true story about two farmers in Canada. One day, the dog of one farmer got loose and mauled to death the two-year-old child of his neighbor. The devastated father cut off all relationship with his neighbor. And the two men lived in cold, defiant relationship for years. Then one day, a fire devastated the property of the dog-owning farmer. It destroyed his barn and all of his equipment. He was unable to plow and plant, and so his future appeared doomed. Except the next morning when he woke up, he found that all of his fields had been plowed and ready for seed. And upon investigation, he discovered that his grieving neighbor had done this good deed. Humbly, the rescued farmer approached his neighbor and he asked him if he had plowed his field. And if so, why would you do that? After all that's happened, and the answer was clear. Yes, it was me, the former enemy said. I plowed your fields so that God can live. I plowed your fields so that God, God can live. So my friends, the Christian faith, it's not only about affection and friendship, it's about forgiveness and reconciliation. And we have that power as Christ's followers in Colossians, four, five, and six, here's what it says. It says, be wise in the way you act toward outsiders. Make the, and he's talking about people who are not in the faith. Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation always be full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. So the question then is this, how, do, how, does, how does this work? How does this work when I'm trying to share my faith, when I'm trying to extend my faith to other people? How do I share that gospel? Here's the first thing to do, you guys ready? First thing we do, talk to God about people before you talk to people about God. That opens up the doorway. I have a client, trained him for a lot of years. And we, he knew where I stand, uh, he, he knows where I stand as a Christian, he knows where I stand spiritually. And we wouldn't have too many conversations um, about that, but one day, and this was a, a, about a year ago, his father passed away. And so that opened up spiritual conversations with him. And then it got to the point where I just looked at him and I asked him, I said, I said hey man, let me ask you a question. Why would, um, why would you be allowed in heaven? And he said, because I'm a good person. And I looked at him and I said, permission to speak freely. <laughs> and he said, yeah. And I said, you're not. And I said, and here's why, because I know you, and I've listened to you, and I listen to your conversation, and I listen to how you treat people. I'm not saying I'm better than you, but I'm telling you, you're not a good person. And then he said, but I keep the commandments, and I said, okay, name them. <laughs> so that opened the door for me to share the gospel with them. And I said, listen, here's the thing. Christianity is not about you being a good person. That's the biggest lie. Christianity is about faith in Jesus alone. And that will change your life, and then you'll see a change in your behavior from the inside out. Let me give you a couple mistakes to, to avoid when you're trying to share your faith with people. Don't force the conversation. Let the natural outflow of what happened, um, and this is a natural outflow of what happened in Jesus when I have a conversation with someone. So simply tell your story. Let me give you a number five. This is the benefit of reconciliation, and here's what it says. In 2 Corinthians 5, 21, God made him, and this is the simplest explanation of the gospel that you can find. 
God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So through our faith in Christ, we're forgiven and we're made right with God. It's the glorious exchange where Jesus takes our sin and gives us his righteousness. In 1 Peter 2, 22 and 24, here's what it says. He committed no sin and no deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross. Read the rest with me. So that we might die to sin and live for righteousness by his wounds, you have been healed. And here's, just so you know, salvation isn't just for eternity, it's for the here and now. Once you come to faith in Christ, it will change your life, it gives you direction, it gives you purpose, um, and it doesn't mean you won't have problems, it just means that you have someone to walk through the problems with you. Does that make sense? All right, so here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna close with a story. And just so you know, I've told this story a lot, and I think in pictures, I see thing, things in pictures. So as I tell this story, it has taken me weeks to unpack this story, and so I see it from a lot of different angles. But this story happened on Wednesday, February 21st. And I started my day off just like I normally would. I always start my day off, I have coffee, I have Bible time, I have prayer, I journal, I study my sermons. But as I was leaving that morning, I just finished journaling, but I had this thought, and here was the thought. I said, Lord, if there's anything that you want me to do today, just let me know I'm available. That was my walking out the door prayer. And then I had a thought, a real quick thought, oh, go visit Jim, um, who is in the rehab center. Um, and so I, he was a client of mine, and he had fallen, and so I thought, that, that's what the Lord wants me to do. Now, I know that sounds really holy, but the truth is, there's a Chick-fil-A near where Jim was, and I love their chicken noodle soup, and Wednesday is chicken noodle soup Wednesday for me. So, so anyway, I go visit Jim, then I come back, um, I go get my soup, I come back to the gym, um, and then it was really unusual because I had a a bunch of odd calls that day. Um, there's times I call it Trouble Tuesday, and so on Tuesdays what I do is I'll call my friends who are going through difficult times through, through um, divorces or through illnesses, and I'll, I'll just talk to them. But on this day, everything, it, it came on Wednesday, so I'm thinking, okay, well, maybe this was part of my prayer. So then I teach a jiu-jitsu class, and at the end of the day, I'd worked a 12-hour day. Um, I was really busy, it was 6.30 at night, and my older son, Kyle, he texts me, and he says, hey, do you remember the guy that we were praying for um, named Jason? I go, yeah, I do. I go, well, listen, hospice is in, um, and can you come and pray for him? And my son lives like an hour and a half away. I'm like, well, I can, but where are you? And he goes, well, I'm in Fosterburg, and I'm like, well, where's Fosterburg? So it's a half hour away. So I'm like, okay, I'll do it. So I call my wife, because um, my car's old, and I just live in a very small little, my gym, my gym is here, my house is here, and within a five minute area, um, the church is. So I, I can just use my car, I don't have to buy a new one. So I call her and I said, hey Jen, can I use your car? And she says, so listen, I'm out doing church work, I'm with a group, I can't do it. So I run home, so I'm taking my old car to Fosterburg. So he drops me a pin and here I am on my way. So as I'm driving, I'm just thinking about this and I'm like, okay, I knew that I'm supposed to be there. I knew that this was the prayer in the morning and I knew this is what was supposed to happen. So I'm driving to Fosterburg and it was hot that day. And so I turn on that air conditioner and um, a, a warning light comes on in my car, check inlet fuel. And so I turn off the air conditioner. So then I go a little further and I turn on the air conditioner and the light comes back on. Now listen. I'm not Mr. Goodwrench, but I can put two and two together. If you turn this on, this light's gonna come on, so turn it off. So anyway, I get to, I'm, I'm going toward Fosterburg, and it is really dark and deep in the country. And there are no lights, I take this little turn, and there are no lights anywhere, and I'm like, looking around, I'm like, man, I hope my car makes it, because I just don't know if my jujitsu will work against Sasquatch. I'm just not really sure at this point. <laughs> 
But as, I, as I'm watching, as I'm looking, I see these really weird, creepy trees. And I was telling my client about this. I'm like telling this client the story. And she goes, oh, those are Harry Potter trees. And I'm like, listen, I've never watched Harry Power, Potter, but I'm sure that's right. If there is a tree, that's a Harry Potter tree. So anyway, I'm driving and I get there. And it's, listen, it's the last house on the right. So this is a movie. And there are cars everywhere. I have no idea where I'm going and what I'm walking into. I don't even know if I'm in the right place. Well, I see my son walk out. I'm like, okay, perfect. So I park my car, give him a hug. He goes, hey, listen, Jason's over there, but we're going to go over here. And I'm trying to, I'm trying to process everything that's going on. So I walk into the, into the house. There are people everywhere. Now, I'm an introvert, okay? I know that sounds weird, but I just am. And so um, all these people are around me. And right when I walked in, my son says, hey, this is my dad, he's a pastor. And there was a guy that took his hat off and I'm like, wow, this is really weird. I don't even know what's going on right now. So he said, there are people out, out back, they're having a barbecue and they're having a party. And then he said, the hospice nurse is with Jason in that room. And so, so he goes, we'll wait until you can go in. And finally, I was able to go in. Well, I was, I've been through these things before and usually it's a private room that you go in. But when I went in, he was in the living room in a hospital bed. And when I looked at him, I was totally shocked because I'm like, oh my gosh, he's close to death right now. I mean, it was a shocking view for me. And honestly, I didn't know what I was gonna do. So I went back in the kitchen, I told everybody, I said, hey, listen, I'm gonna pray for Jason. If anyone wants to come in and be involved in that, you're welcome to do so. And I thought maybe one or two people would. Everyone came in. So here I am in this situation, and th someone that I have no idea where he's at spiritually, I'm thinking he's, he's an Adam, um, and I have all these people around me, and there is no book on telling you what to do in this situation. And so here's what I, I just said a silent prayer. I said, Jesus, you gotta show up. And then I looked at Jason, I said, Jason, can you hear me? And he shook his head no, which meant, yeah, he was a little confused. And I said, my name's Steve, and I'm a, I'm a pastor. I'm a, with you, is that okay? And he said, yeah. I said, well, let me tell you something. I said, Jason, you're gonna die. And I said, and it could be soon. And here's what's gonna happen. You're gonna stand before a holy, righteous God who's omniscient, all-powerful, he is just, he is holy, and he is a consuming fire, and you don't stand, you don't have a leg to stand on because your sin has separated you from God, and there's no amount of good works that will get you into heaven. Do you understand? And he said, yeah. And I said, but let me tell you something, you have an advocate, and his name is Jesus, and he lived a perfect life for you and you can trust in him, and that will get you in. There's a part in the Bible, and we call it the thief on the cross. He was in a situation that you are in right now, and he didn't go to church. He didn't get baptized. He looked at Jesus, and he says, hey, remember me when you go into your kingdom, and Jesus said, today you will be with me in paradise, and I said, Jesus, I said Jason, do you want that advocate? Do you want Jesus in your life? Do you believe? And he said, yeah. I believe, and so it was, and listen, here's what happened, here's what happened. I saw this verse, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel, because it's the power of salvation. It is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. I saw the power of God that brings salvation enter in to a man in Adam and make him alive in Christ. The only thing I could relate it to is years ago, Christmas morning, 1988, my mother died in my arms and something happened. There was a light that drew her to heaven. There was a light and that light is Jesus. And I didn't know exactly how to explain it. And I don't even know how to explain this, but I felt that happen. And I felt that same light enter into this man's spirit and make him alive to God. And he went from the from the doorstep of hell to an eternity with a holy and righteous God because of what Jesus has done. And then I looked at the people around me because I didn't know what to do next. And I looked at them and I said, let me tell you something, this same gospel that I gave to Jason is the same gospel for you and for me. And because of my faith in Christ, I will see Jason again. And I 
totally implore you to accept that same gift. And let me tell you this also, I'm really sorry that you're going through this. It breaks my heart that you're going through, you're losing a family member, a father, a friend, and a son, and it's devastating. It's horrible, but listen, Maybe, just maybe, if we reframe it, we can see it differently. Maybe if this didn't happen, that he might have lived a whole life but never heard the gospel, and you might have never heard the gospel also. And so sometimes we look at things that we don't understand them, but God is sovereign and he totally makes a difference. And I looked at them and I said, let me pray for you. And then I quoted a, a verse and I said, here's a verse, it's be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, Let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God which passes all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. And I looked around the room and people were crying, and once again, I didn't know what to do, and so I went, hey, can I get an amen? And so (laughs) on cue, all of those people said amen, but it seemed to me that there were some extra amens coming from heaven in the middle of that. And so then a couple of days later, And I thought about it, and I thought, you know what? The sovereignty of God had me ordained that. He ordained that prayer in me, and he ordained that situation, and he had went before me because Jason knew somehow what was coming. It was an amazing thing, and then I had to do the funeral a few days later, and so I called my team, and I said, hey, would you guys pray for me? And my pastor friend Rufus, he called me at eight o'clock that morning, and he said, hey, listen, two and a half months ago, He said, I made an appointment with Car Star to get the dings taken out of my truck. And I looked at the obituary where you're going today, and it seems that this guy worked at the car store, Car Star that I'm going to. And he said, when I got there, the lady at the desk said, hey, listen, we're not gonna be able to do much work on your truck today because we have to go to a funeral. And my friend looked at him and said, yeah, I know, my pastor's doing that funeral. And so, Here's what's interesting with that. Albert Einstein said this, coincidence is God's way of staying anonymous. And so when you look at this, you see that in a totally different perspective. So as I thought about it, I got there Wednesday night about eight. And when I looked at the obituary, he died at Thursday, 11, 26 p.m. That's 27 hours and 34 minutes. He made it by 27 hours and 34 minutes. It's cutting it too close. It's cutting it too close. But he made it, and that's the grace of God in our lives. Let's bow our heads and pray together. Jesus, we just, um, we just come before you, and we acknowledge your grace to us. We acknowledge your goodness and we acknowledge your grace. And there's some people here, some people watching online who never said yes to you. Um, and if that's you today, you can just say this prayer with me in your heart. Say, Jesus, I say yes to, d- to you today. I believe. Take me from being in Adam to being in you. And from this day forward, by the power of your spirit, I choose to follow you. It's in Jesus' name I pray and everyone said, Amen. I'm going to have you guys stand. We're going to close together in worship, and then I'll come back out for a benediction.
So as a little addition to that story, there were over 20 people that came to church last night from Fosterburg that was able to share the gospel with that group last night as well. So if you guys need prayer, there will be people up here to pray with you if you need prayer for healing. If you want to um, have an anointing for the ministry of reconciliation, just come on up. If you just accepted the Lord, come tell somebody about it. There's also the... Um, the civic engagement group that are out front if you guys want to get involved in that. And now for a benediction. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of God's Holy Spirit be with you all. God bless you guys. Have a great day.